Hey, how's it going, you guys? We are going to be playing Reaching today. This is a Danganronpa game that is based off of Danganronpa V3, and it's also based off of a fan fiction of what they thought V3 was going to be like. I'm excited to play this one. I haven't played a Danganronpa fan game since Checkmate, and that was technically my first one, so this will be my second one I played. Really big fan of the Danganronpa series. Uh, I've played through all the mainline games, and I've watched the animes for them, but I have not played Despair Girls. That's the only one I've not played. And I haven't done the new, um, like, Decadence, or I, th I think there's, like, some kind of island game. I haven't done that, but I played a lot of Danganronpa. So let's go ahead and jump into this. The room is dark and quiet, completely devoid of any signs of life except for the slight rise and fall of his chest as he lies on his back. The absence of windows keeps any traces of illumination from creeping in. Even the bedroom door fits seamlessly into its frame, barring any light whatsoever trying to make its way in from the outside world. There's no clock to be found anywhere at all in the room, not even a wristwatch. The slow, tedious ticking of an analog would only rub at his nerves, like an itch under his skin, or under the skin. And the searing glare of a digital would do nothing but ruin this tentative, lightless peace that he's finally achieved. He's already well aware that every so often the television will come on, informing him that it's precisely 8 in the morning or 10 at night. Whether or not the information is actually correct doesn't really interest him. Time lost its meaning for him long ago in this game. He stares aimlessly at nothing in particular. There's no light which, with which to see anything, but even if there were, he's left his usually cluttered room barren this time around. Gone are the stacks of cardboard boxes, the piles upon piles of books and binders which were once half hazardly strewn all along the floor at random. Gone is the mountain of crumpled paper balls, which once dominated his trash can, filling it to the brim with discarded theories, plans, and memos to himself. And gone, too, is the whiteboard, which once stood, stood front and center in the room, completely covered with pictures of his fellow classmates as he stood in front of it, trying for hours on end to pinpoint the link try tying them together and the ringleader behind this game that they're in. Rather than just gone, he should say they never existed in this room in the first place. He doesn't need them this time around. There's no point anymore. Oma stares at the ceiling, feeling like the darkness pressing down on his eyelids every time he blinks and thinks about the mechanical press which killed him the last time. Well, they're really just going straight into V3 spoilers. It's almost funny, he'd really thought that one might actually get the job done. He sighs and shifts onto on the bed hoists the covers up over his shoulders, and tries to sleep. But it's a futile effort, and he knows it. Exhaustion seeps through every bone in his body, beating him like a drum. Like a mechanical press crashing down. Right above his eye. But he still won't be able to sleep no matter how hard he tries. After all, whenever he closes his eyes, he can clearly see each and every wrong step. Wrong turn. Wrong move. He can see every wrong guess he's ever made playing out on the backs of his eyelids like a movie on a screen. Reaching. I really like this little graphic here with the hands like trying to touch each other. Dang, they made him look like really chibi and adorable. I like it. <laughs> I'm Oma Kokichi. He told him so instantly when the girl and boy asked for his name that that much came to him easily. But when it came to his talent, the answer tripped over his tongue and he couldn't quite figure out why. I'm I'm the super high school level supreme leader. I mean, it's been so long since I played Danganronpa V3. I don't even remember what his freaking talent was. Like, it was, it was very confusing. It felt like the right answer, and yet it left him with a nagging sour taste at the back of his mouth, as if he told them he was really blonde haired and six feet tall. Yeah, that would be a lie for sure. He chalked it up to having woken up unconscious in a locker only half an hour earlier and pushed the sensation down before flashing them a grin. Ooh, it's Saihara. S Supreme leader? The boy in the hat went pale and Oma's eyes lingered on the, the way his fingers instinctively twitched in surprise. I'm sure that's just a joke. Just a little joke to lighten the tension, right? She arced an eyebrow back at him skeptically, clearly hoping for an affirmative. The silence stretched on just a moment too long, and then he broke it with a laugh. Nope, it's the truth. There was that sour taste again. I'm the supreme leader of a secret organization. 
wow they really captured the way like his facial expressions change he gives that like really like dark and sinister look and then he gives this really happy bright smile but don't worry it's nothing too dangerous as long as you don't try to dig up too too much information on it the boy and the girl exchanged looks that clearly questioned the state of his sanity but they didn't pose any more objections to his introduction or his talent and when the boy in the hat reluctantly reached out his hand for him to shake he almost took it but the arrival of a strange looking student was that a robot interrupted the scene and he took a step back and watched as the other two took the lead again it was very interesting so far i'll say that Oh, we're literally, we're literally like 10, not even 10 minutes in the game and someone's dying. Who could have done this? No one answered Gonta's question as they all stood grouped together in the library, staring down collectively at the body which had previously been Amami-chan. The words seemed to hang in the air between them, as tangible as the layers of dust settled over the books on the shelves. The only thing to break the silence was Monokuma. Gosh, I, I'm, it's so weird seeing Monokuma and not hearing oop boop boop boop. As he walked in, he gleefully told them that since the culprit for the crime was refusing to step forward and name themselves, they'd been having an investigation. One resulting in an execution for either the culprit or the lot of them. Doubt. Suspicion. He saw the seeds festering among them almost instantly. He saw in the way in which they all took a step back or how held themselves a little bit more warily as soon as the news left Monokuma's mouth. He wanted to do the same, in fact, but his eyes were fixed on the trails of blood seeping from Amami chans skull. Who could have done this, indeed? But that's not really the right question, he thought to himself. Why would anyone do this? It didn't just add up. It just didn't add up. Why go through all the trouble to take a life if not for the graduation opportunity which Monokuma had presented them with two days ago? Monokuma told them that the first person to kill could graduate with no trial at all, as long as they went through with it. So why not take the deal? Own up to it and leave, no questions asked. Why risk a trial at all? As though an answer to his thoughts, Akamatsu-chan stepped forward into the center of their makeshift circle, and she raised her head high. Everything's gonna be okay, everyone. We're going to find out who did this, and we're all going to get through this. It didn't escape his no notice that her voice was shaking and her cheeks were a little too flushed, but he could feel her intentions loud and clear all the same. Oh my gosh, they look so adorable. I love these sprites. <sighs> like, it's so, like, chibi and cute looking. I just, I can't. It's so good. Everyone else seemed to feel them, too, because Aruma-chan stopped grinding her teeth. Yumeno-chan's eyes looked a little less unfocused than the last time he had glanced He had glanced her way. Gonta wiped the tears off of his sleeve cuff and sniffled twice before nodding. Akamatsu-chan's bright. Most of the group did a double take as though they'd almost forgotten he was there. All but two of their eyes towered over him physically, but he met their eyes with an old, familiar confidence. The kind of confidence expected of him as Supreme Leader. His head started to pound at the thought, but he paid it no mind. We can't waste time like this. We need to start investigating him fast. Yes, exactly. What happened here? It's a tragedy. There's no way around it. If, but if it's for everyone's sake, we have to keep going. We have to find whoever did this. We need to find out who they are with no room for doubt. As far as investigating goes, I think I could be of assistance. What the hell do you mean, as far as investigating goes? You're a detective, so of course you're going to be at the center of any investigation plan we could come up with. Get a grip, Saihara-chan. Huh? All three of them discussed how to best split the group so that they'd be able to gather as much evidence as possible. They sent them all off quickly and surely on the tasks that they thought best suited to each of their talents. But as they all set off in twos and threes, he found his eyes pulled again to the bloodstained wood on the library floor. Yeah, I remember this. this. Oh, I remember this trial. I did it. Tears. 
I did it, and I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, everyone. More tears. I'm so sorry, Amami-kun. And the whole group was in shambles, and Akamatsu-chan was standing in the center of their circle once again. Only the difference this time was that she was about two minutes away from being sent off to die, and all because she wanted to help. She told them the ent entire sordid tale about how she had only wanted to target the ringleader and put an end to this game once and for all. About how she had tried to stop the killing game before it even began. Please live strongly, live together, find the truth, and get out of here. Her bravery shook them all to the core. There wasn't a dry-eyed one among them, not even Shinguji-chan, whose tears were tinging the edge of his mask a slight, slightly darker color. Not even himself, he realized, and his fist shook as he tried to meet Akamatsu-chan's eyes while she said goodbye to each and every last one of them. It's the least I can do for her, as just one leader to another. Knowing that they were all going to uh, lose her hit hit them hard as a group, but he was fairly certain that they could circumvent this worst-case scenario from happening again. As long as they weren't hit with any more two-day time limits, he was sure that they could limit their losses. Don't give up. All of you have to get out of here. Please live. live leave this place together. Take care of yourselves. And take care of one another. The metallic shriek of the collar snapping around Akamatsu's chan's neck interrupted his train of thought. Everyone in the room yelped and stepped back, and Oma watched wide-eyed as Monokuma showed them all for the very first time the true meaning of the word execution. Saihara chans screams echoed across the room as they lost Akamatsu chan from their numbers for good. He had known that the gloom of the very first trial would hang over them like a blanket in the following days. The morning after the trial, they had all met up for breakfast and tried awkwardly to piece together where they might go from here. But no one's heart had really been in it. So when Tojo-chan expertly slid a plate of western-style breakfast in front of them at the table... Wow, thanks, Mom. This really hit the spot. A single beat in which everyone went silent, staring at him. Perfect. Oopsie, my bad. You know how it is with homemade cooking. The whole room seemed to let out a breath that they didn't know they were holding. Then a nervous chuckle erupted from every corner of the cafeteria. I really like like this perspective, like that Oma was like really just trying to cheer up everyone after this whole game. Pretty crazy. I mean, I, I, I haven't played the game in like so long. I played it like, I, I don't know, around the time it came out or like a year after. But it's been a few years for sure, so it's like a really good recap. Even Tojo-chan's nearly normally immovable expression of refinement had looked a little strained, as though she was biting back the urge to smile. As long as it's an honest mistake, I'll let it slide. However, Omokun? Yes? Can I have your word that you won't call me mom again? Oh yes, absolutely. Cross my heart and hope to die. You have absolutely no intent to stop anytime soon, I see. <laughs> Just reminds me of that meme, mommy, mom, mommy, mom, mommy. <laughs> With the matter concluded, everyone, little by little, went right back to paying attention to their breakfast. However, the cafeteria no longer felt like a place of nothing but sadness. He could hear conversations, dishes clinking together. Despite themselves, they all sounded just a little less miserable than before, and Oma chalked it up to a victory. Their progress had been slow but steady, and little by little it seemed that they were all finally acclimating to things. Saihara-chan in particular had taken the most drastic leaps in development. Oma had thought that the jumpy, nervous boy dressed in all black would almost definitely hold himself up in his room forever after the school trial, but instead he was the, one of the ones trying their best to keep the whole group going. For his part, Oma tried formulating their best course of action. Of course, finding the truth and getting out of this place was important, but he thought it best that they all get accustomed to school around them first. They would never last long if they couldn't find a way to abate the tension somehow, and their laboratories and new areas of exploration had offered them all some small measure of comfort and distraction from the tragedy they witnessed. Monokuma's motive videos had posed a slight wrench in his plans, but it wasn't as though he hadn't anticipated another motive after the first one. Everyone agreed easily to the plan he had put forth. As long as they only had motives for each other, and not their own, it would be easy to avoid any deaths this time around. Yumanao-chan's magic show even seemed like an exciting initiative, 
Perhaps it was a show to lighten the mood and boost morale was exactly what they all needed. That was what he thought before they'd found Hoshi-chan's body floating in the tank. He was suspended there for only a single instant until the piranhas lunged and ripped the meat straight off the bones. At the sight of everyone's shocked faces, the tinged red water at the tank w while bones and chunks of flesh settled. And the bright, beaming smile on Yamano-chan's clueless face as she stood posing, unaware of the catastrophe behind her. Oma felt the sour taste in his mouth again. The time for the investigation was running out. Only Momota-chan's aggressive willingness to pitch in and Saihara-chan's deductive skills seemed to be keeping them from entirely falling back. Well, this was only to be expected. A murder taking place only days after Akamatsu-chan's sacrifice had smashed all that morale he'd spent time trying to boost into tiny pieces. And he could already see in their eyes how they were convinced that Yumino-chan had done it, but he wasn't so sure himself. As they passed along the pool, he stopped suddenly. In the midst of the water filling the pool, there was something dark and ragged, as though it had torn at the edges. Sahara-chan! Over here! The other boy paused, already halfway to the other building after seeing nothing of interest, and doubled back to take a look at where he was pointing. They fished it out together, and all they could tell that was that it might or might not be a piece of black fabric. Oh, we almost missed this one. Thanks, Omakun. You've got a keen eye for this sort of thing. It was the first genuine, albeit tiny, smile he put on uh, Saihara Chan's face since the whole fiasco had happened. Oh, what's this? I don't think I've seen you smile like that in a while. Well, it's not like there's much to smile about. And there wasn't. Not really. Two of their classmates had died mere days ago, and one more lay dead today. But despite all of that, Saihara Chan still found it in him to smile. He decided that, that was a good thing. See, I can't agree with that. Even if things aren't great right now, we're still alive and kicking, aren't we? I can't really be that optimistic right now, but I guess you have a point. Hmm? Optimistic? Moi? I don't know about that. In any case, you're the one who stopped bringing his security blanket everywhere. Dare I say, you look a bit more confident than before without it. My, are you talking about my hat? That aside, I wouldn't say I'm feeling particularly confident right now. I'm only an assistant detective, for now. But as far as using whatever talent I have for the sake of the group, I feel like if we all do that, we'll be able to prevent further deaths. So I can't really keep that hat on. Does that make sense? Hmm, I suppose it does. It makes sense in a very manga character-esque way. Eh? That's... No, that's probably true. Momotokun mu must be rubbing off on me. Yeah, well, it's a silly train of thought, but it's not like it's entirely bad to think that way, either. Considering how things are right now, we might need a bit of hope to stay afloat. Exactly. And if we can't do that much, I think we may all just make it. Oma flashed him a grin and threw his hands up behind his head, ignoring for just a moment or two longer the hell that they were about to have to face again. Alright, enough chit-chat. Let's keep looking for clues. We can waste time all we want. We'll have a tea party, even. I bet Tojo-chan won't mind making enough sweets to stuff ourselves silly. Murmurs and hesitant whispers of why flew up from all around the trial room. Hojo Kurumi stood a little ways apart from the rest of them, her gloved hands crossed elegantly in front of her. She was looking surprisingly resilient for someone who had just been sentenced to death. Hey, hey, when did it start? When did you start lying to all of us? Anji Chan's usual whimsical voice carried a rather stinging note for once. Or stinging. You kept telling us you were going to take care of us, but was that always a lie? Her eyes seemed surprisingly sharp for a girl so often looking to the heavens as she talked about her god. Oma thought back to the western-style breakfast and all the offers to do laundry, thought back to the slip of the tongue he'd had in calling her mom in front of everyone. If he and Saihara-chan hadn't found that piece of her glove, just where would they be now? Would she even have shed a tear as they went all past, all went past to their deaths? And even if she had, would those tears have meant anything at all? Don't be stupid. Of course not. No one would care for others more than themselves in a situation like this. And I'm a fool if I thought otherwise for one second. How could he have fallen for such an obvious ruse? They had all fallen for it, hook, line, and sinker. But wasn't he the one with the most at fault for f failing to see through it? 
What kind of supreme leader did that? Not a very good one. If I tell you why I did what I did, you're all going to be very sorry. Tojo-chan's voice had cut in among the whispers and clatter, still clear and refined even in such a situation. You regret knowing. Are you sure you'd still like me to tell you? Bill hesitated for only a few moments before nodding in unison. The room was like a scene of a massacre, just like a picture taken straight from a history book he was sure he'd read at one point or another. One of the pictures that the teacher would always tell you to skip past, of course. I never should have let her speak. Another crash, more screams. The exosols were on a firing rampage and everywhere he looked was blood, 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 more blood. I never should have even let her open her mouth. Oma wasn't even sure where he was going or if there was anywhere to go. There was an explosion of screams and gunfire, and if he stopped too long he might notice Momo Tachan's body groaning and wheezing on the floor, or Gonta with a chunk missing out of one of his shoulders, but struggling still to stand in front of Yumino Chan Jabara Jabara Shira Chan. His eyes darted around the room, caught sight of an elegant maid in a black dress just managing to slip to the exit. I should have known that distracting us would be her only way out. Win us over with her story, get us to fight for her. Meanwhile, she... A hole opened up in his chest the moment he stopped moving, and the entire world shuddered as he fell on his side. He had to keep going, had to find a way to stop Tojo-chan from... from... from what? Everyone in this room was already dead or dying. How could I have hoped to avoid this scenario exactly? And it hurt. It hurt. It hurt. And it hurt. There was a strange, elevate, strangely elated feeling in the pit of his stomach as he closed his eyes and let the world go dark. He woke up in a cramped locker, the taste of blood in his mouth and a pounding in his head just over his right eye. The darkness pressed him like a vice. So he only did he did the only thing his disoriented self could manage. And staggered out before heaving the contents of his stomach all over the floor. Am I dead? Am I alive? He couldn't find a good answer to those questions, and the pressure behind his eyes still kept building. His whole head felt like it was about to split. The entire his entire mouth tasted unbelievably sour. He had been here once before and he couldn't think of any good reason for it to be happening again. The last thing he remembered was a car, dark figures, huge machines with bullets firing, yelling for help, screaming in pain. He was still on the floor retching when someone else ran in and he felt the sensation of a cold metallic hand along his back. Excuse me? Hey, are you okay? Are you okay? What's your name? Omo wondered if he should have never stepped out of that locker the second time. He opens his eyes, a slit, as the television suddenly comes on in the room, blindingly bright after 14 hours of sheer darkness. It tells him that it is now 10pm. He quickly goes back to tuning the rest of the program out, letting the colorful figures bounce around and put on their useless show until the screen blinks off again. He is thankful for the strain being taken off his eyes, but it's still not as though he'll be able to sleep. They all had thought he was scared, probably, or more... Or it was more like they hadn't known what to make of him. He never introduced himself when they came again. Seeing his state, Kibo had called out frantically for help. And when the girl and the boy with the hat had come running, Oma had taken one look at Akamatsu Kaide's still very much alive face and turned to wretch again. That time, there hadn't been anything to come up except bile. It took him half an hour to stop shaking. The whole time, they kept looking at him awkwardly, clearly unsure of what to say. Occasionally, someone else would walk past the classroom to peek in and see what the commotion was about, but he just stared speechlessly at them. Yo, the name's Amami Rantaru. Everything okay in here, or... He didn't say anything in reply. Only stared speechlessly at the same familiar hair and face of the, and body of the boy he was fairly certain he'd seen dead on a library floor. I like how flamboyant he looks. <laughs> Freaking this avocado guy. Akamatsu-chan looked up at him fittingly for a second, a split second before standing up and taking the conversation out to the hallway. Perhaps they thought that they would be kinder on him, but he still heard the words in shock nonetheless. 
Saihara-chan continued to send him tense glances every so often from the safety his cab provided. As though afraid that Oma might pass out or start screaming at any moment, he, he just ignored him. He closed his eyes and tried to sort out the, his memories to figure out what he remembered just before waking up. But as he thought back on a black car pulling up, dark hands grabbing him in the middle of broad daylight on a busy street, he kept remembering Akamatsu-chan's limp corpse dangling over the keys of a piano. Amami-chan's body curled in on itself while blood oozed out of his skull, and he couldn't tell if there was any difference between one set of memories or the other. Hey, Amami-chan! Oma raised a hand in greeting, and the other boy waved back, although hesitantly. Oh, hi there. Don't sneak up on me like that. You almost gave me a heart attack. He had never greeted any of the group with his usual gusto this time around, even after the whole locker incident had passed. He had barely had it in him to tell them his name before stumbling back to his room. They probably thought of him as a nervous wreck. There was no way for him to tell them what he had seen. In the end, he just let them think he was claustrophobic from being shoved into the locker and in shock from being kidnapped. He wasn't even sure what he, of what he had seen. There was always the possibility that it had been some kind of hallucination. Maybe he was still hallucinating, in fact. He also wasn't sure whether the possibility was comforting or not. But the more he thought on Amami-chan's, Akamatsu-chan, and Hoshi-chan's lifeless bodies, the more he felt he ought to do something. Hallucination or not, it had all felt very real at the time. And if they were still heading down the same path in this same killing game, then he felt he at least should try avoiding the same outcome. What kind of person could see all that and not even try to intervene? He wasn't sure where to begin, though. Telling any of them that he'd seen them dead would only convince them that he was out of his mind, or easily the most suspicious member of the group. They'd probably just take it as a threat. He hesitated, but couldn't help but ask. You're not... Trying to do anything by yourself, are you? I mean, about the time limit? Amami Chan looked at him long and hard, the usual half smile gone from his face as his expression hardened. Oma blinked, trying to keep his face impassive. Of course not. I wouldn't do something like that. Probably wouldn't end up well, you know? Right, yeah. Oma saw a muscle twitch on the other boy's jaw, and he knew that he was lying without even knowing how to put it in words himself. Well, I was just asking. Everyone's been worrying about the time limit lately, and it wouldn't be good if anyone went off doing things on their own. I'm just trying to help. He smiled and put his hands behind his head, trying to remember just how he managed to look friendly the very first time around. I'm the super high school level supreme leader, you know. Mommy Chan looked a little less suspicious after that, his eyebrows arcing up behind his bangs. Then his slight half smile returned. No offense, Omakun, but I wouldn't really have pegged you th that for your talent. Then he turned, leaving Oma alone in the middle of the hallway. Omakun, why would you think that? He'd known Amami-chan wasn't going to listen to him, so he thought perhaps Akamatsu-chan might. But the situation wasn't getting any better, and he didn't know how to defuse it. I... I just heard you and Saihara-chan talk about meeting up in the library the other day. A lie. Well, technically it wasn't a lie. It probably still counted as... Only a few days ago, when he had heard them both admitting their plans to meet up in the library together, after they found Amami Chan's body, she studied him shrewdly, clearly trying to see if he was implying anything or not. He hadn't told her anything specific other than telling her to stay away from the library, and she clearly didn't know how to make heads or tails of it. After a while, she sighed and scratched her head. Look, I don't know what you heard, or thought you heard. He stared at her unblinkingly, almost daring to hope for half a second that she might change her mind about the whole thing, even if Amami Chan didn't. But it's not nice to make up lies. Again, he saw it all again. Everything went exactly the same. He saw the splatters of blood on the library floor. And the way Akamatsu-chan's fist, fist trembled when she stood there and saw the body. Only now, he knew exactly why she was trembling in the first place. At the trial, they all hit the exact same roadblocks. He could see the hesitation on Saihara's Chan's face, and the fear of exposing a lie for a more painful truth. But Oma no longer wanted to wait around for the trial to play out painfully, gradually, slowly, the way it had the other time. Like ripping a band-aid off a wound in one go, he spoke up, causing a sudden hush to fall over the rest of the group. Hey Akamatsu-chan, 
Weren't you and Saihara-chan both hanging around the library before all this happened? Oops. He could see the hurt in her eyes. Seeing her wonder why she'd speak with such noticeable accusation in his voice, when well, she was already stealing her resolve to do what she had to do. But he pressed his point. After all, she was the one who had said she didn't like lies. He passed by Tojo-chan on the way to do his laundry, just a few days after the trial. Omakun, is there anything I can lend you a hand with? This is my lab, after all. Feel free to ask. I can do anything that needs to needs being done. He emptied the laundry basket up before it slipped, as it was full to the brim with the same copies of his uniform. It was something he'd been delaying, having spent most of his time recently by dragging a whiteboard into his room from one of the unused classrooms. That and a whole mess of binders, notebooks, and any spare writing materials he could find. He'd been devoting his time lately to thinking about the second trial that he knew was coming. But that meant he hadn't exactly been paying much attention to daily necessities like clean clothes. The pile made it difficult for him to see where he was going, but he could still make out Toju-chan's elegant, tall figure appearing at him. He might have almost thought her offer kind, even if it was just her way of trying to fulfill her talent to the fullest, but now it was hard for him not to snort. He set the basket down on the floor and opened one of the machine doors, then flashed her a smile as though in thanks. Nope, I'm good, Tojo-chan. Thanks. I can take care of it myself. I make a big show of being a bit childish, but I'm actually pretty good at handling my own chores. He looked at him dubiously, but there was definite signs of a smile tugging at the corners of her mouth as she nodded. That's what you'd like, then. Yeah, of course. I'm gonna turn back to the washing machine and began throwing clothes in. Wouldn't want to make trouble for you, Mom. He paused just before rapping on Ho Hoshi-chan's door. It was best to get it over with and try, he knew, but what exactly was he supposed to say? Hey look, I, I know you want to die and all, but trust me, I've been there and it didn't work out so good. <laughs> Hell, I even woke up again, stuffed in a locker like it never happened. Yeah, that wasn't the best course of action. He sighed and tapped his knuckles against the door after all. After a few moments, the door opened a crack. And then Hoshi Ryoma stood there in the doorway, looking at him suspiciously. You? The tennis player looked past him on either side, clearly wondering why he was there outside his door, like this, this when they very nearly hadn't said a word to each other ever since the day the game had begun. Is there a problem or something? He didn't sound hostile, merely unable to comprehend what he could possibly want from him. Oma sympathized a little at the notion that this was a person who didn't think of himself as someone who had anything to offer to others. He hadn't noticed that about him at all last time. If he truly is a supreme leader, then he's definitely trying to keep this group from dying, and it's something he should definitely take note of. No, there's no problem. I just wanted to talk to you. He let a sentence trail off, still contemplating the best way to broach the subject. Clearly, he'd botched his chances with Amami-chan and Akamatsu-chan wasn't even sure he was a, there was a right way to phrase this kind of thing at all. I wanted to ask what you thought about the whole plan with the motive videos. Hoshi-chan's face darkened, more of surprise than anything else. What I thought? What you mean, like I wanted to see mine or something? Oma nodded. Something like that. I mean, I know we discussed it already at the meeting earlier, but you get what I mean when I say it'd be really dangerous to go looking for our own videos, right? Oshichan didn't respond, so he continued talking on ahead, trying to fill in the silence. I didn't think you would, I'm just worried something bad might happen if any of us saw our own videos. It doesn't sound like something we should let Monokuma bait us into. The awkward silence stretched out again, and what, just when he thought Hoshichan would never answer. Yeah, well, that ain't gonna happen. No need to worry about me. He was still processing those words when the door slammed in his face. I don't know if that sounds too hopeful or not. Sounds like he's probably going to. At the second trial, Oma felt as though a lump were stuck in his throat. Part of it was undeniably due to the fact that Hoshichan had wound up in the Prana tank the exact same way as last time. The sensation was mostly due to the fact that he knew the hard part was from here on out. Hojo-chan stood with her hands clasped, and this time he knew better than to think that she had begun resigning herself to her fate. Are you sure you'd still like me to tell you? There came the same familiar words as last time. 
He watched with narrow eyes as the whole group leaned in close and listened to her speech about how the whole of Japan was falling into chaos in her absence. How it would be better if the whole lot of them were to die for her sake. She spoke eloquently and confidently and as sincerely as a mother to her children. You could tell as her eyes bored holes into the side of her face that she believed every single word she was saying. But there was still something about her words that stank horribly. He didn't let a single moment pass this time. The group was just beginning to get well and truly riled up when he spotted her. She was trying to slip away unnoticed to the back of the room as everyone debated whether or not they could take on the exosils with the forces they had now. Hey Tojo-chan, their eyes locked. Like it or not, we voted for you. Don't think it's kind of unfair to miss your own execution? The room went dead silent for one beat, two beats, and then... Tojo-chan sprinted off at a run as the exosols in the room pointed her way. Monokuma erupted into a fit of cackles, and almost stood and watched, and reminded himself that at least he and the others were still standing in the room this time around. As Tojo-chan's body slammed to the floor with a dull finality, Oma found that he couldn't hate her. He remembered the bullets that tore open his chest the last time, the screams of blood and chaos in the air as everyone had tried to avoid the exosols the dead bodies littering the ground. They'd avoided that outcome, and that was all that mattered. But all he could think as he looked at Tojo-chan's prone corpse was the way in which she fought to the end. Failing to reach the exit as the saws began to grind against her bones, and the look on her face once she realized that there had never been an exit all along. The look on her face as she came crashing back down to the full weight of gravity and of death. It left him with a curiously light sensation in the pit of his stomach, and the same sour taste in his mouth. He threw himself full force into his investigation after that. It was all new territory to him from this point on. He hadn't even lived this long last time, and he wasn't nearly naive to think that Monokuma wouldn't hit them with another motive soon enough. Unsure of what he needed from the library or the other rooms, he took everything that he could carry. He piled it all into cardboard boxes until they were half his weight and struggling to push them. Search repetitiously down hallways where no one else was around. One night, he read up on mock picking in one of his books he had stashed away and thought it would be a potentially useful talent for future investigations. He read it himself in front of his bedroom door to practice, only to find he was surprisingly good at it. As he stared from his right hand to his left, he tried looking tried long and hard to think of where he might have picked up a talent like lockpicking. It didn't seem like something particularly essential to a super high school level supreme leader. He remained lost in thought until his head throbbed once and once and decided to drop the issue and leave it for later. As he hung pictures on his whiteboard, he put culprits to the left, victims to the right, and the ones remaining even farther right. If there was one thing he was sure of, it was that the ringleader behind this whole game had to be somewhere within the group still. He stared at his handiwork as he spun the marker around between his index finger and thumb, not even sure where to start. Maybe if he was lucky, he could at least avoid it. moving any more pictures to the leftmost part of the board from now on. The television hadn't come on again, and he was, and when he opens his eyes next, he can only surmise that it's not morning yet. For the first time in hours, he sits up in his bed, letting the sheets fall off him as he stretches his aching joints. Lack of use is only making them sore, and he doesn't particularly care. They're always sore whenever he starts over. They never stop being sore. Oma just stares blankly towards the center of his room. He's almost certain for a moment that he can still see the outline of a white board and cluttered heaps of cardboard boxes. All the fruits of an investigation that in the end amounted to absolutely nothing. That's impossible, of course. The room is still pitch black and it's only been an hour or two since the last he tried and failed to sleep. He turns back on his side and closes his eyes again, and for a moment he almost would swear he can faintly hear the steady thrum of a mechanical press, but it's just the sound of the blood rushing in his ears. And you're sure you know how to do this? I said I did, didn't I? You say a lot of things, Omakun. Maybe you'd like to try it? Oh no, that's quite alright. That's better. Lockpicking takes a lot of work, you know. It was the morning when, reluctantly, some of the religious student council members came to them. According to them, they were all supposed to meet at their usual spot, but today something unexpected happened. Anji-chan, 
their de facto leader never showed up. The fact alone wasn't something that worrying. However, it had already been two days since they first encountered her lab door locked, and she hadn't touched the food that her followers had devoutly left for her. Saihara-chan and himself offered to investigate the door, while Harukawa-chan and Yumeno-chan had f and others had flocked to the back door. And so he pressed forward with something akin to pure certainty in his gut. Ah, alright, it's open. Great, let's get going. There was no shock in him when he and Saihara-chan stumbled in on Anji's corpse, lying on her side. The floor beneath her stained slick with blood from a gash near the face of her neck. If anything for a death, he had not pre yet present presence before. He was pretty sure that they of what they would find in there ever since Yumeno-chan came whimpering about her friend going MIA. It wasn't until later, while they were carrying out their investigation, that he realized perhaps he should have pretended to be a bit more surprised about the wax dolls. But he already knew what it was like to walk into a room and see the dead brought back to life. So he supposed it couldn't be helped that a mere imitation just didn't cut it for him. In fact, he was finding it very hard not to count Angie Chan's body as just another wax doll in the room. Maybe if he died again, he'd stumble out of a locker and there she'd be, walking and talking and praying to her death, uncaring God. With one dead body already accounted for, he didn't foresee there being another. Life is funny that way. As he stared down at the open wound in Ch Chaba Chabashira's Chan's neck, he apologized silently. He hadn't meant to assume that this kind of tragedy wouldn't happen again, just because it had already hit them once. After all, wasn't he the best one to know that there wasn't necessarily a limit on anything at all in this horrible game? And when he heard Shinguji Chan asking Monokuma about the fine print when it came to multiple murders, he knew, although he couldn't even explain to himself how, that there were those in this game who would kill only because of the game, and those who thought of killing itself as the game. He threw himself in the investigation with such a fervor afterwards that even Saihara Chan seemed a little lost. He collected as much evidence as possible, making lines and connecting points on the canvas in his head since he lacked his whiteboard board here trying desperately to ignore that his nagging voice in his head that kept wondering if he'd still wake up in a locker again if he failed to prove the culprit this time around. Everyone had their reasons for killing, he supposed. Akamatsu-chan had, had had hers. The whole group had understood her, had loved her, had known exactly how much it had cost her to take that risk for her, their sake. Oto-chan had had hers, claiming the weight of the entire country on her shoulders, willing to do absolutely anything it took if it meant returning to the people who needed her most. They weren't reasons he could necessarily forgive or condone. Complete forgiveness was a line if he found dangerous. If you forgave one murder, could you forgive another? At what point did it become okay to take another life? And even if you had thought it was okay, would you be able to look at the person you were about to kill in the eye, explain your reasoning, and, he still and still believe it was really, truly right? He didn't believe that there was ever a point at which it was okay to draw the line and call it forgivable, but he could understand why most people would say that they had their reasons. Shinguji chan is shaking, sweating. His mask pulled down to reveal surprisingly feminine features and a mouth that could only stammer out one word over and over again. Apologize, 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 apologize. As he stood dumbfounded looking at the young man, any possible reason he might have had eluded him. Shinguji chan had killed two of them and tried to pin it on Yumeno chan. And now the charade was up, now that he had no other recourse. He shook at the thought of death creeping down his back all the same. Apologize, 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 apologize. Ah, oh, looks like you guys completely broke him. Too bad. Monokuma's deadpan voice startled them out of his revere, causing his head to snap from Shinguji chan to where the bear sat. Not that it doesn't have its own charms, but it's just kind of sounding like a broken record by this point, don't you think? Monokuma heaved a surprisingly convincing sigh for an animatronic robot. Well, whatever. Guess it's voting time. Long after Shinguji chans screams had faded away and the smell of smoke and salt was strong in the air. 
almost stared at the wall and heard a chorus of apologize, 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 apologize beating in his brain, cheesing on memories he couldn't quite place. Following Shinguji Chan's trial, Oma Kokichi decided it was time to snoop around. Trying his best not to dwell on what happened, the investigation was back at the forefront of his mind, preoccupying all his time. He snatched even more binders and books from the library, reluctantly moving three more pictures over to the left side of his whiteboard. Even more reluctantly, he came to the conclusion that his investigation was at a standstill unless he could investigate his remaining classmates even more directly. This was how he found himself in outside Harukawa Mak Maki's laboratory door at night, well after the 10 p.m. Anji Chan's religious student council might have tried to keep them all well under thumb and stuck in the dormitories, but Anji Chan wasn't here anymore and her short lived reign was at its end. He stared at the imposing red door, wondering if it was really alright to barge right in. She made it painfully clear both times that he met her that she wouldn't tolerate anyone trying to look at inside. She very specifically mentioned the word screaming. And that just piqued his curiosity all the more. Why would a super high school level child caretaker feel the need to say that? No matter how it looked, nothing about her added up. If worse came to worse, he could probably fudge his reasons for being there and come up with some quick excuse. Swallowing hard, he turned the knob, pulled the door open, and was met with the sight of Harukawa chan, holding a throwing knife. His mouth opened before it caught up with his brain. Harukawa chan? In the time it took for him to draw his next breath, she was across the room lifting him up with one hand around his throat. You. Didn't even seem to be taking her any effort whatsoever as she lifted his frame and squeezed around the windpipe more and more tightly. Harukawa. His words came out like a wheeze, choked and mangled. His hand scrambled to, fi to find purchase on the hand around his throat, trying desperately to peel off even a finger or two back, trying to get at least, at least one more breath in. But her grip was like a vice, and her one hand was more than enough to hold him in place. Even as he struggled with all his might, I told you not to come in here. She said it as if choking him was a simple necessity, as if she was stomping on a bug she found crawling on her living room. Please. He couldn't even see the walls of the room around him now. The longer she choked him, the more his head swam. He was finding it harder and harder to keep moving his hands. Please don't, he wanted to say. This is pointless. This is reckless. This is meaningless. You're only going to get killed too, or everyone else's. And what's the point even? With his lungs aflame and the world a mess of pitch black spots, he lost consciousness. He had known it was to fear death, what it was to fear death, but Harukawa Maki caught, had taught him that it was to fear pain. The next time he opened his eyes and found himself standing in a walker, he didn't come out for a long time. Instead, he slumped him to the floor, staring vaguely up at what little light the slits of the top allowed in. His chest rose and fell rapidly, but instead of gasping for air that he longer found himself lacking, he just rubbed it at his throat. He could swear he felt the phantom traces of Harukawa-chan's unyielding fingers there still, even he, when he knew it was impossible. Was she the ringleader? Was she not? Had she just killed him for reasons completely unrelated to any rhyme, reason, or motive within the killing game? He didn't know. With his mouth still tasting sour, he touched his throat lightly one last time before stepping out of the locker. And this time when Kibo came to the room and asked if he was okay, he looked him in the eye. And smiled easily. Sure am! Aw, oh, come on, Akamasu-chan. You don't have to sigh like that. I mean, yes, I'm being kind of mean to you. But that's kind of your own fault, you know? He wasn't sure why he teased her so hard when she'd come by to ask if he wanted to spend time together. In the past two loops, he'd accepted her offer gladly, and they talked at length about group leadership strategies, classical musical pieces, and her favorite types of tea. But this time around, he strung her along, made her feel as if he, he wanted to spend time with her one moment, then shot her down the next. She was clearly losing her patience, running her fingers through her, her hair messily as she heavy, heaved out a sigh. This time around, it was plain to see that she was regretting not spending her time with anybody else right now. My fault. That's a lie, he wanted to say. Except it wasn't. He just re kept remembering how easily she started to doubt him the moment he'd spoken up about the library. 
The Akamatsu Kaide in front of him now wasn't the same Akamatsu Kaide who had rejected his attempt at helping her. It wasn't really fair to take things out on her like this, and yet, if he'd failed to get through last time, then he'd just have to try harder this time. I mean, you forgot about me. She wasn't technically forgetting him, after all. There was nothing to forget this time around. They'd never met before this game, and maybe she'd understand better if he put it in these terms. Maybe if she could understand what he meant, then he actually stood a chance of explaining the situation to her more fully. Huh? I don't... What do you mean I forgot? Oma searched her pale, shocked face for any trace of understanding. He found none. Akamatsu-chan, you're so mean. Even though I never forgot about you this whole time, even though I cared about you. Huh? Uh, huh? Are you sure you aren't just mistaking me for someone else? She raised a good point. Technically, she was someone else. But she also wasn't. How could I mistake you for anyone else? I mean, do you know any other super high school level pianist? Akamasu-chan? It was the best hint he could think to offer, but it went unnoticed. Like bait, left untouched on a fishing hook. He stared at her with wide, round eyes as she fumbled for words, and at the moment, as the moments ticked by without her catching on, he came to the dry and satisfying conclusion that she simply wasn't going to. In the end, he threw his hands behind his head and laughed at her. Well, you really fell for a huge lie like that. You're so gullible, Akamatsu-chan. Akamatsu-chan furrowed her brow and looked at him with undisguised disliking. Clearly, she was frustrated at the idea that she spent so much time worrying only to be made fun of in the end. That was fair. But he had hoped one last hint for her, that this, and this one he hoped would leave more of an impression rather than going right over her head. Hey, but if you keep being that gullible, don't you think you'll wind up being the first one to die? This, this uh, loop is definitely going in a different direction. I can't say that. Let me see the motive video you got, Hoshi-chan. I feel like uh, Oma is acting a lot more like he usually does in the game. I wonder if they're like trying to paint this picture that Oma was this really nice guy before he came uh, into this killing game, and then like all these events changed him. I think that's an interesting take on it. I like it. The tennis player looked the most surprised he'd ever seen him. His usually creased eyebrows arced high in complete astonishment. Oma just stared at him calmly, his face carefully neutral. What the? Weren't you the one who said we weren't going to watch the videos? You said it was a bad idea or something. Oh, that was a lie. It was getting easier and easier to say that. I wanted to calm everyone down, but I can't really guess what Monokuma might be planning unless I watch the videos for myself. There was a long pause. Oshichan clearly seemed to be trying to sort out however much of what he was saying right now was true or not. No one was glad to see from his face that he couldn't reach a conclusion one way or another. The other boy crossed his arms and stared up at him dubiously. Still, why'd you want to see you? Who's I got? It ain't got nothing to do with you. Look, I don't know what you're planning, but you gotta know it sounds fishy. Leave me out of it. He made to slam the door again, but Oma was expecting it this time, so he stuck out a hand, pushing it back just before it could close down his face. Look, Hoshi-chan, it was not very nice of you to talk about my plans when you're still trying to hide yours. I already know you want to see your own motive video. He thought back to how twice now he's seen Harukawa Maki standing coldly at the class trial, arms crossed, refusing to give the rest of the group her alibi. And I know who you think has it. So let me take one look at the motive video you got and I'll stay out of your way. There was a cold feeling in the pit of his stomach as he said it, a sense of dread and resignation all at once. Sorry, Hoshi-chan. It's not decided that you're going to die this time around. But this is just in case. Hoshi-chan stared at him from the crack in the door long and hard, clearly trying to make up his mind. Just when it seemed like he'd never answer. You ain't trying to hurt no one, are you? No. He's glad that the there was at least one question in this conversation he could answer quickly and honestly. Oshie Ryoma disappeared from the doorway and returned again, holding out a thin tablet for him to take. When he made to shut the door again, Oma called out, remembering the reason he chose to interact with Hoshi-chan rather than just pick the lock to his room. Thanks, Hoshi-chan. This is a huge help. I'd be in really deep trouble if you went around. You could hear Hoshi-chan snort from the other side of the doorway. Yeah, like I believe that. The door slammed shut again. So, was this Maki's then? 
Same thing back in his room, he watched a video to his heart's content. Most would only confirm the suspicions he had been festering since he woke up in that locker last. But he wasn't a single step closer to knowing if she was the ringleader or not. On the whole, he'd rather doubted it. Harukawa-chan stuck him as a type to do as she was told rather than anything else. That she'd been imaginative enough to fool them all and r run this entire killing game seemed unlikely. But he still didn't move to grab one of the whiteboard markers or to push her picture out of the list of suspects. It was unlikely that she was, she was the ringleader, but just in case he'd rather not discount his options just yet. Still, it was with a grim sort of satisfaction that he replayed the video over again. Getting them to trust him was starting to seem an impossible task, but it had been easy enough to change things when he started doubting his classmates. Monokuma's voice blared through the thin speakers a second time. Harukawa Maki, a super high school level assassin, a tragic orphan girl who found solace and family in the sweet, sweet children who flocked to her. Almost stared at the screen, remembered the sensation of his windpipe being crushed, and began formulating a plan like something like relish. Hoshi-chan sure must have been delicious, though. I mean, did you see the way those pranas just jumped in on him? Ah, uh, stop it, stop it, I'm gonna be sick. I mean, really, they just gobbled him up. Didn't leave a scrap behind. Kinda makes you wonder what he tasted like, right? Stop, just stop, can't you see you're making her sick? Not that they left any for the rest of us to try, but I guess that's what makes it even more curious. I mean, they could've just left one bite, right? Just one? I said stop. Tabashira-chan's raised voice cut across the trial room, and Oma's eyes never stopped flicking between Tojo-chan and Harukawa-chan. Every single person in the room looked like a mixture of queasy and startled, even angry. And yet, those two seemed curiously calm in the midst of it all. His smirk widened a little. Nishishi? <laughs> Sorry. I was just curious, is all. Gosh, yeah, he's like slowly becoming his usual self. Harukawa Maki's hands wrapped around his throat for the second time, but this time he had witnesses. Oh? He stared her down as she lifted his feet off the ground, forcing himself to smile even as he felt sweat forming on his brow. Are you really going to kill me in front of everyone else? Harukawa chan stared right back, her eyes cold. But unlike last time, there was real anger in her gaze, and he was glad to see it. There were so many questions he wanted to snipe back at her, but he scarcely held the had the breath for all of them, so he settled for just one. That's not very nice. Are all child caretakers like this? Th then again, maybe there's a reason for you to not act like one. What What do you think, Harukawa Maki, super high school level assassin? Just as her lip curled into a sneer and Oma wondered if even having witnesses around was enough to stop her from killing him, someone in the group yelled for her to put him down. And he suddenly hit the ground with a thud. It had been a close call, but the sweet rush of oxygen to his brain was enough for him to call it worthwhile. He stayed on his knees and coughed until his chest hurt, but there was a deep sense of satisfaction in the pit of his stomach. He kept remembering the way her eyes had flashed when he called her a murderer, and the coughing gave way to bile, which gave way to the urge to laugh. You are a murderer, Harukawa-chan. Tojo-chan might have killed Hoshi-chan, but you're a murderer all the same. And at least this time, everyone knows it. Dang. That one was really interesting. The television comes on again to inform him that it's precisely 8am. He opens his eyes and stares at it vacantly, wanting more than anything to, for it to turn back off and leave him in the darkness again. Mascots on screen read lines from their little script, they stumble around incompetently, and all he can think of is the only thing that this parody of a show is missing is a laugh track to truly highlight its stupidity. The show ends and the screen mercifully fades to black, and he flings an arm up over his stained, aching eyes. His heartbeat speeds up a little at the thought while he's, that he's wasted an entire day in his room doing nothing, waiting for the time limit to pass. But only a little. It's not as though any of his plans got him anywhere, all those times. At least he's being more upfront about wasting his time now. His head is starting to throb, his ears still ringing from the shrill voices of this morning announcement. Maybe now, if he turns back and burrows himself into the sheets again, he might actually be able to fall asleep for an hour or two. As she shifts to face the wall, he can hear the faintest sound of a knock against his bedroom door. But almost stays in his bed and doesn't get up to answer.
Well, honestly, that was really good. I really like the idea of Oma just like being in this loop where he has to like get to the end where he has to like solve what's going on. That really adds like a new, like fresh perspective on Danganronpa V3 that like he was doing that all along, you know, like that could have been the case. I don't know. I really liked that. I think, I think the art was probably my favorite thing though. I mean, the story was really good too, but I liked the art. I like how like cutesy it looked too. But yeah, I mean, that was that was reaching chapter one. I think the fan fiction goes further. I think it's like a few years old right now. So I'm sure there's it's probably finished. But this is chapter one. I don't remember the name of the person who made this, but they made it for a gift for their significant other. Which I thought was kind of cute. Uh, if they make another one, I will definitely play it because I, I really enjoyed that. I like found myself just getting sucked in and I was like, I had to like shake my head for a second and realize like, oh, I need to... Uh, focus again I was too wrapped in the story and like hey I'm I'm in reality right now I'm existing but I'm like for that moment I was like really sucked in the story uh really good I really liked seeing more of Kokichi he was a character that like yeah just kind of came off as like annoying and just like a trickster but like I liked seeing that side of him that he's like actually caring about everyone there and he's like slowly becoming a little bit more I guess for lack of a better way of describing it a little sadistic like not not saying he is but like the way he comes off to other people is just like this guy who doesn't care and is just trying to make chaos you know i i really like this different perspective change it was nice but anyways guys that was reaching chapter one darkness really good really enjoyed that i i will definitely play a sequel if there is one but anyways, guys, I will be linking the fan fiction if you want to read on yourself or if you want to read this again, uh, you can do so. And I'll make sure to leave a link to the game as well. So anyways, guys, I'll see you in the next one. Have a good one.